for the topics that we have spoken on. Uh, now is the time for question and answer. Uh, it will be quite simple and straightforward since there are about 100 people here in this room. Uh, we, I'm, I'm going to allow one person to ask one question first. Please keep your question or your comment short to less than a minute. Um, and uh, you'll be directed as, at one of the speakers or it could be a question that all four speakers could answer. Um, or they can also choose not to answer your question rather than entirely up to the, the speakers to do that. Yeah? Uh, please do identify yourself uh, and we can have the first question. Good afternoon everybody. I'm Narayani. I'm now a graduate student with Kaplan Unisat studying business, uh, sorry, uh, Bachelor of Arts in Communication and Media Management. My question is to Mr. Uh, uh, Professor Charon George. Uh, it's over 20 years ago that we didn't have the internet, and students put together like in Tian and Men, and the polit political capital would totally be removed, either through military means or even just, you know, like the ISA or the ISD in Singapore. So how now with the internet, would the faculty members or academics support such student movements? So uh, I'm not sure if I caught your the question totally, but um, I mean, if, if you are referring to uh, real-world offline student protests like Tiananmen or even just 10% of the size or 2% of the size of Tiananmen, uh, that has become extinct in Singapore for how many decades? Four, four or five decades. Yeah. That's all. No. There was a student protest 24 years ago. Which was that? Oh no, I mean Singapore. Uh, in Singapore, yes. that was the next thing for, even for, for a very, very long time. Yeah. So I, I don't see the internet as being extremely relevant to whether there is or isn't or how academics would. Uh, it's it's a just, I guess, a totally different issue which is, has to do with the rights of uh, uh, public assembly and so on. Um, that there's no evidence that the arrival of the internet has increased the appetite for student demonstrations in Singapore and it has in other countries. Uh, so yeah, so I guess it's interesting to figure, try and figure out why, but yeah, just, I'm not sure what else to say. Uh, I'm not sure that I'm so trust the first thing. Uh, yes, uh, my name is Francis Park. I'm a retired person. Uh, I, it's wonderful to have three lawyers here because these, these are questions that uh, have been at the back of our mind for such a long time. And I, you say that if we block, we, we uh, work within the law. But sometimes the law is the interpretation is so nebulous in some ways. You know? So that's one. That more recently, and these were judgments, one by Philip Pele and one by uh, I think both by Philip Pele. The recent case about the Hogan case, right? where the Prime Minister unfettered uh, and, and, then, and he says that it is not by election but by the rule is that he does one word by any election so it's okay by election that means he has right but if it's if the word were by any election then okay then. so again the spirit of the law clearly is that when you have a, a by election it must be held right if the seat is vacant you must have it right but the interpretation is so nebulous and of course the third one is uh, uh, Ken Jaranam's case about lending money to, I mean, having parliament approve uh, a loan. Uh, and the judgment was that a loan doesn't need to be approved. Only borrowing needs to be approved. But as any layman thinks, come on, you're risking the, the country's reserves. It must be approved by parliament. So I'm, my question, I'm not a lawyer. So that's why I'm asking this question, because as a layman, I really cannot understand how these interpretations can be made. And it, it flows to what we are saying. If you are a blogger and you think the law is interpreted in some way by, cause, by, by your own layman's interpretation, probably you're wrong because the judge can be interpreted any way they like, it seems. So can I have the lawyer's opinion? The decision concerning uh, whether or not it was an offence for politicians to remain in a polling station during the time of the polling um, was not a court case. It was actually, I think, the government asked the Attorney General for a legal opinion as to whether it was lawful or not. And, and at that time, the uh, AG was um, the recently retired uh, Chief Justice Chan Zekyong. And I, if I recall, um, his opinion was that it was not an offence. 
Um, I'd say this was probably based on a, a fairly technical reading of the section. The section said it was an offense to, um, to remain in the vicinity of a uh, police station. I can't remember whether vicinity was the word you but something of that nature. But it said nothing about whether it, uh, it was an offense to be in the police station. So he said, well, on a reading of it, technically speaking, if you are in the police station, it's not an offense. You can be in the vicinity of it, you know. Um, but I would say that that is a very, very technical of it. I do not know whether it's actually been amended by now. Um, I, I, offhand, I can't recall whether it's actually been amended. But I would say that is um, uh, difficult to justify, especially you know, in order to get into the uh, police station, as you point out, you have to come, you have to pass in the vicinity of it. So technically, you know, uh, they could have committed an offence. Uh, I would say that, but uh, and that was so, that was quite technical. As for the whole gun by election. Um, uh, interpretation. It's on appeal, so we'll, I think it's on appeal, but I'm not mistaken. So we'll, we'll see what the uh, Court of Appeal says about it. Um, again, it is, it is um, uh, based on a particular reading of that particular provision of the Constitution. And what the judge said was that he compared it with a 1955 um, order of counsel, which was in force when Singapore was still uh, a colony of the, of, of, um, the United Kingdom. Um, where there were provisions in the constitution at that time. One which said that, uh, I don't know whether you have to cast your mind back, but we used to have a day when um, the the, there was no parliament, but we had a legislative assembly. And at that time, the legislative assembly was made up of elected and unelected people. So there was a provision saying that if there's any vacancy that arises in a seat that is unelected, i.e. appointed by the governor, then it shall be filled by appointment and then the elected seats shall be filled by election. So he said that, we're obviously, that was the predecessor of the current provision that we have, and it shows that um, it was intending to point out the manner in which you fill the seat, not the fact that you actually have to fill it. But of course what happened was that we did away with appointed <coughs> seats entirely, so that provision took, disappeared and we were left with shall be filled by election. But he said that since that was the intention at the time in 19 it did not change when carried into the current constitution. Um, I personally, I mean, I have read the, the judgment and um, I'm thinking whether or not the judge should have made um, such a clear distinction between it's either the mode or the fact of holding the election. And could it not have been both? As in, it explained that the provision requires both that it help, be held by, by way of an election and that an election should be held. So I don't know whether the sort of court of appeal will, um, uh, how it will rule on the matter, and I'll be very interested to, to see the, uh, what happens. As for the Article 144 case, this is the provision which says that um, uh, no loan that is given or guarantee that is taken by the government um, may, may, be, may be done without uh, permission of parliament, and I think the concurrence of the president. Um, this case, again, actually, looking at the um, uh, reasoning of the judge, I would say that I actually agree with it because he went into the legislative history of that provision and it seems that from all the parliamentary debates it was never contemplated um, the way uh, Mr. Geranum contemplated it. Perhaps it should have been but it wasn't. So I think it's actually quite justifiable based on, on what was the intention of parliament at that time. Of course this doesn't change the fact that um, if it is thought that more protection is required perhaps there needs to be a change in the wording. But I'm, I'm sort of less skeptical that, that the court read it wrongly, just because there is quite a, he referred to quite a lot of white papers and debates in parliament, and at no stage did anyone say that um, if a loan is to be given, we should have concurrence. It was always about taking of loans and, and, and so on. So, but you can see that, I suppose you can see that the similar safeguards should ex be extended to that kind of situation. But the, no, the, excuse me, the broader question is, this is the sense that, you know, it's the spirit of the law, come on. And isn't the law made to reflect what the spirit, what... May I request, sorry, uh, not okay, the okay. speaker are speaking. Sorry. So. But it's okay, I'm going to finish speaking. I mean, I would say this, the thing is that the court is supposed to... Uh, oh, well, uh, uh, how shall I answer this? Um, Well, we, we work under what we call a representative democracy, which means that you elect leaders to then 
decide best what is for you. And if they have decided that that is the only provision that's required, in a sense, what is required is a change in the law, not so much that the cost should somehow miraculously come up with a new interpretation of it that departs very differently from what was intended by Parliament. This is, I suppose, the issue. It's how I would, I would, I would say it. You know, if, if there is a weakness, then we should, we should look to reforming that provision. Um, okay, uh, I think I'll just address Francis's question about how ordinary people uh, really might not have a good sense of how to go about writing or, or even what the courts are thinking. Um, I like to think in the majority of cases, uh, they wouldn't have to find out because it wouldn't have to go to court. Uh, but in cases you've cited that have gone to court, uh, again, maybe because I'm young, uh, I'm more starry-eyed and optimistic about uh, the direction the courts are moving, uh, especially when it comes to constitutional questions. Uh, so, with regards to, for instance, the outcome by election case, uh, the glass is half em empty or it could be half full. The half full way of seeing it is, in the first place, uh, the Attorney General's chambers tried to strike out uh, the application by saying, look, the Prime Minister has made his mind up that there will be an election. So, there isn't a real controversy uh, for the courts to consider. Uh, but Justice uh, Philip Pillay said, well, Go ahead, let's, let's hear the thing on the merits, and it proceeded. Uh, and then subsequently, uh, when the issue of cost was argued, uh, he said, well, uh, this was an issue of public interest, uh, and therefore it's not quite correct to uh, award costs against Madame Bellema for having brought the, the question before the courts, despite the fact that it had failed. Uh, and this is quite remarkable if you think about what the implications are. That means that any one of you uh, could potentially bring a constitutional question uh, before the courts and say, look, I'm asking this not in my own interest, but in the public interest. I want, I want this to be clarified. Uh, and there potentially would not be cost uh, implications on you. Now, this, this is on appeal, right? So it's still an open question what the Court of Appeal might say. But I think the very fact that we've got to a stage where we have a high court judgment that has cited decisions in New Zealand and in the UK uh, on point is quite remarkable. Uh, and some of these decisions uh, they cited were uh, a New Zealand uh, case that went up to the Privy Council on a question of whether or not a non-governmental organisation could bring, uh, could be protected in costs for raising the issue of the preservation of the Maori language uh, before the courts. Uh, and this was one of the judgments that Justice Philip Pillay cited in saying, look, uh, if you bring a question of public interest before the courts, the courts will say, we'll protect you, we might not uh, order costs against you. Right? So the class, on, from your perspective, of course I'm disappointed that the decision was they didn't go that particular way, but well, the glass is also half half full, etc. Right? Um, but another instance of the glass being half full is the law on contempt of court, right? Uh, before the recent judgments uh, by Justice Quentin Low and uh, Justice Andrew Pang for the Court of Appeal, uh, the test in Singapore was the inherent tendency test, uh, and one of the most extreme examples of the application of the inherent tendency test is this: if a drunk man at a dinner party stands up and starts saying a uh, judge is corrupt, uh, that statement alone has the inherent tendency to scandalize the court regardless of whether or not people believe it. This was uh, the, the law in Singapore prior to Alan Shedrick and Public Prosecutor. Uh, the Court of Appeal in Alan Shedrick and Public Prosecutor uh, took a more nuanced perspective. It said, in some cases it can be, in some cases it can't be. Maybe it depends on how many people there are at the dinner party. Uh, and whether or not people believe him. So they departed from the inherent tendency test to what we now know as the real risk test, right? Uh, there has to be more than a remote possibility uh, that this statement will bring the administration of justice into, uh, into question. Uh, and the third uh, case that makes me hopeful that there really is a good future for uh, constitutional uh, jurisprudence developing in Singapore 
uh, is the 377 day striking out case uh, where the court said, look, again the Attorney General's chambers tried to strike out uh, an application to declare 377A unconstitutional on the basis that, look, the charge brought against this person originally was 377A but was later reduced to one of, uh, I think, public indecency, right? Uh, so the Attorney General's chambers said, we don't really need to talk about whether the law is constitutional or not anymore. Uh, there's no, th this person is not in danger of uh, being prosecuted under 3778 at all. So he doesn't have the standing, he doesn't have the, in legal terms, local standby to bring the case. Uh, and the Court of Appeal uh, disagreed with High Court and said, uh, no, he, he does. And this case should be heard fully uh, on the merits. And that's going to come up again, I think, sometime next year. So, I, I think the glass is half empty in the sense that I don't think we're ideally where we want to be uh, in terms of um, progressive uh, legal developments. But I, I think slowly, uh, the courts are getting there. Yeah. I'd like to ask about, about precedent that was mentioned earlier. So I'd like to know in cases where there's been um, a, judge, a judgment made about a certain uh, law that was broken, in what cases will the courts actually push out a more severe punishment? And I mean, what, what is the defense in such a case? How strictly do they have to follow precedent in the Singapore system? Thank you. Yes, uh, strictly speaking, they do follow precedent. I mean, if, when I pay for a subordinate cause, you know, if I make an argument, the first thing I, I want uh, the, the judge wants to know is, you know, the district judge wants want to know is whether it's bound by a high court decision. So it's, 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 there's, there's, no way, there's no way the court will not follow precedent. Usually they follow money or not. But there are, but, but at a higher level, at the court of appeal level, there is, uh, I think the court of appeal recognizes that look, this is the highest uh, court of the land, and sometimes we, we need to be a bit more flexible to do justice. And, 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 and they don't decide for this particular case, but they have to decide for other cases as well. So there is a bit more flexibility. Uh, to cite two examples, uh, uh, I was involved in the earlier uh, case, or ISA case, uh, Cheng Suan Se case, you know, where the court in, in, in the 1988, the Court of Appeal overturned a 17-year-old ruling uh, where the court said that, uh, I think it was in 1972, now this uh, 71, Lee Mao Tse, now this editor of Nan uh, Chang Pao, he was detained. And, and, and at that time, the, 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 the law pronounced by the Chief Justice uh, we saw him was that look, no judicial review, you know, sorry, non-justiciable. Non if if it's uh, if Lee Mao is detained and if, if, if the minister for home affairs says that it should be detained under ISA, that's it. But in, in, in the <coughs> 17 years later, in 1988, you know, uh, and the QC who are handling uh, the ISA cases, uh, the operation spectrum cases, uh, they argued, no, you know, for example, uh, why, why shouldn't, why should powers not be unfettered? Uh, why not, uh, sorry, they say that powers should be uh, fettered, exercise of powers should be fettered. And, and in order to persuade the court of appeal that, then the QC's quoted cases of uh, detentions without trial from Commonwealth countries, including Zimbabwe and you know some similar one. And and, 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 and QC told the court of look, come on man, the other other countries in the Commonwealth say that you no know, powers, nuclear powers can be should be fettered. Uh, should be uh, uh, yeah, cannot be unfettered. There should be judicial review. And and, and, and I think that influenced the the, the, the court of appeal at that time. Although one month later government changed the law, no 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 appeal, we don't want free counsel and whatnot. But, but the thing is, the court can be influenced at a higher level, they can, and sometimes are influenced. Uh, in the part of the Dow Jones case, that didn't succeed. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, Donaldson. Donaldson. Hello? 
I want to ask about copyright. I hope that the lawyers here can elaborate on fair use because uh, there are certain issues like, for example, Straits Times uh, regularly reproduce photos from Facebook against without permission. So we will to seek lawyers' opinion on whether that is actually legal or illegal, whether strict sense, whether people should even whether newspapers should ever print photos of people without permission. And also uh, I also have another question with regards to uh, Hello? Okay, and uh, another question is also uh, on ownership of images. Because what I understand was uh, there's a, there was a I think it was a court case in America regarding uh, ownership of images because for example, when a celebrity or a model walks along in a public space and someone takes photo, it appears that his or her modeling agency can sue the photographer if the photographer actually published the image online. So this is again uh, another issue that's related to that. Thanks. Fair use by newspapers. Newspapers have a special privilege under the Copyright Act. There is a fair use for the purpose of reporting news. So I think that's what um, Straits Times relies on. Uh, all you have to do is place uh, acknowledge where the source was. Uh, uh, so once you say this one from where, then they can rely on fair use for that. So um, the question is whether or not it expands to to any because it says for the purpose of reporting news. So it doesn't say who reports that news. So whether bloggers can rely on that, I have no idea. We have no cases brought to the court yet. But there's a US case. Yeah, but we're not in the US. <laughs> <laughs> um, but as, as to your second uh, question about um, if, say, um, you happen to photograph a model that's walking down the street, um, I don't think the position in Singapore is the same as that in the US. Um, basically, there is no right of privacy in Singapore um, under the common law. So you can't actually sue someone for saying you have breached my privacy in that kind of setting. There may be other <coughs> situations where you, where you pass confidential information to someone and then that is released, that's a different matter. But if it's, you're not doing anything confidential, you're walking down the street and someone takes a picture of you, then the person who takes the picture owns the copyright. And the person who happens to be featured in the picture um, cannot say that that is uh, a breach of any copyright or anything of that sort. That, that I believe is the position in Singapore right now. Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, yeah my name is Awong, uh, from Kampong, uh, West Coast. <laughs> now, <laughs> Uh, some, some stupid questions, <coughs> if I may. Uh, now, uh, is the legal process proportional to the amount of money that one can afford to pay? In other words, in other words, can real justice be served to somebody who's got no money to pay $600 an hour for a lawyer? Uh, now, <coughs> Now, point, point number two. Uh, what I see in society today is uh, lots of fungi coming out of the woodwork. Uh, any Tom, Dick, and Mary can can register an, an internet account, open a set up a blog, and write whatever tickles his or her imagination. My second question is. Would you know and would you be able to share with us how does our big brother uh, catch such people who post mischievous remarks in the internet? <coughs> the question about access to justice, I think that's a really, really important question. Uh, how do ordinary people uh, afford uh, lawyers to charge uh, well, six hundred dollars uh, upwards of the market is six hundred dollars an hour. No, it depends on how senior you are. Okay, <laughs> because if, if you go to some more junior, like we are costless. I don't know how to. I'm just saving a bet, right? Um, but I think really, you, you know, recently the law society has been asking practitioners to do more pro bono work. And one of the schemes they're considering is uh, making it mandatory for every lawyer to do 16 hours of pro bono work uh, a year. Um, I, I've got some doubts about that, uh, about how effective that's going to be, because um, maybe not all lawyers might have the knack for doing pro bono work. Um, so I'm not sure if making it mandatory for lawyers to do that is the solution. But uh, one route that some countries have taken 
is to uh, really put the burden uh, where I personally think it belongs, on the government. Uh, so in the United States, you have a public defender's office uh, that defends indigent people, poor people, right? Uh, that uh, does cases pro bono uh, on taxpayers' money, uh, which is, in my opinion, economically where taxpayers' money should be going to. Uh, some of the arguments, some, some arguments have been raised against it, and. Uh, I think it requires a lot more in-depth study as to how to implement, but that's my personal preference of how to uh, really maximize access to justice, that uh, you, the state should be paying for, for uh, legal defense, especially in criminal matters. My question is, uh, why is it that the, our local press are not doing their part when it comes to something, uh, I'm not attacking government. It's, it's the wrong function of the judges and the government officials. So your question is so the I'm role of the mainstream media I in reporting <coughs> accurately the no, no, They don't even report, they can't call any the general sure. way. You know? So the thing is, uh, why is it that you know this thing happened, you know? Sure. I mean what why I mean none of us and what the uh, GBJC, you know? We got your question. You see, you. Like, well paid, you know, they're like a cheap prostitute of uh, running down a PAP, you know. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I don't know the specifics, I don't know about the case was and so on. I can only make a general remark there. I think in general, uh, actually court cases are a great boon to journalists because uh, it, uh, everything that appears in court, of course, is, what's the term, it uh, comes under absolute privilege, right? So even if, uh, is, that, is that right, is right term? Just absolutely, it's qualified. It isn't qualified? Uh, I thought anything that's reported in court can then be reported by the press. With, yeah, yeah, in that sense it is, right? So, so even if, for example, defamatory statements are made in court, as long as it's in open court, it can be reported by the press. So it's a gold mine. So in fact, I remember uh, covering uh, uh, the uh, High Court case involving uh, Chi Sun Juan, sorry, no, it was SDP versus Xiang Si Tong, right? Uh, it involves Chi Sun Juan as well. Peter, you uh, were representing Chiang, I think, or the other side, kind of the SDP, the SDP at the point. And it was wonderful because all these fantastic infighting in the SD, in the then SDP and so on, all could be covered openly. I remember writing and writing on and on about it. Uh, you know, the, the trading insults, accusations, and so on, which normally couldn't be covered because and most of that, if you report, uh, open yourselves up to libel suit. Yeah. Uh, so I would be surprised if, and, and that by the way is one reason why the papers are going to town with the current CPIB case. Some people feel, oh, this is too much, you know, what's the extra research trying to do? It's, again, it's because the gold mine, the things that are being said there, that then the press can report that in, uh, you know, whereas if it was just picked up through interviews, the press could not report such things. It would be regarded as just allegations. And, uh, so, so why was it that in specific cases the press ignores it? You know, it could be any number of reasons. The, you know, the, the press uh, produces a new product every day, 365, 363 days a year, with thousands of words, hundreds of stories every day. So it's, it's got a higher R&D cycle than Apple computer, remember that. <laughs> iPhone, you know, comes out with two products a year, or whatever, big song and dance. Uh, newspapers produce a new product every single day. Yeah? Uh, it's going to get a whole lot of things wrong every single day for a whole lot of reasons. Ranging from reporter lazy, right? Could be that. Uh, or reporter hardworking, but editor too lazy to figure out what the hell is going on. Uh, it could be because uh, editor on that particular day talking to the right reporter, not interested in that case, more interested in matters you know, uh, topping the EPL, right? Or a judgment call that this one maybe readers not interested. We are interested, but we think readers not so interested. Like, too technical. Who knows what this half glass, half full is? Show <laughs> Who knows, right? Very complicated. I understand it's a very smart editor, but I don't think my readers are interested. My readers are, my readers are more interested in Cecilia Su. Okay? Uh, and really, so there's, don't ask me to speculate why a particular story was not covered. Yeah? Uh, a range of possible reasons why uh, something is not covered or undercovered and so on. All I can say is the good thing now, and the, 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 the situation we should be aiming for is not a perfect newspaper or a perfect blog or whatever. Uh, we, we should be aiming for a situation where at least if some uh, news media foul up their other media to pick up the pieces. And we're kind of heading in that direction. So we are less vulnerable uh, to the mistakes of any one medium.
right? So that they say two days cruise up, never mind, maybe new people will catch it. If Straits Times drops the ball, maybe Mediacorp will catch it. If all of them drop the ball, let's hope TOC catches it. <laughs> Right? Uh, or the SDP website or whatever, right? So uh, 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 that to me is the only hope. Uh, let's hope that there's an improvement in quality all the way. Hi, um, I'm Clara from Marua. I just wanted to quickly ask a question more from a political observer's point of view because um, very late, I think there's been a lot of uh, online activity and um, particularly there's a lot of infamous uh, problems posted by the explicit photos of himself. Um, and that clearly operates outside the law, but yet it's seen as a domestic school disciplinary problem. So I'm just wondering from an observation point of view, when do you see, um, when do you when want to uh, act on a particular matter and when do you wish not to? So I think it's maybe even beyond the OB markers, but more in terms of like prosecutor. I don't even think prosecutorial discretion in this sense, but there's no, even, no charges even brought against um, individual. But uh, Clara, I, I'm not sure this is a direct answer to your question, but uh, you're referring to the NUS uh, guy, or maybe former NUS guy, Elvin. was that right? The, and his sensational video. <laughs> <laughs> was that the one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In general, is there a lighter touch or a hands-on touch? As in why he's not been prosecuted uh, yet? Just or? in general, online activities. Like, is there a lighter approach to what is happening on the and that would be an example of what? The Alvin case would be an example of a lighter touch because he hasn't been stoned. No. Yeah. <laughs> stoned. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, I, I would not only be in favor of a lighter touch, I would also be. I, I think the real problem that we see here in this case and the string of cases of, that we have happening almost every month is actually very petty cases uh, becoming national issues so quickly, right? Uh, whether it's xenophobia or this or that or the other. I was, I was chatting with a friend in Hong Kong recently and he was talking about you know, the, the xenophobia cases in Hong Kong, which are quite serious, right? But he's saying that you know, this goes on constantly underground, but are rarely, uh, rarely are they elevated to the national stage so that everybody's talking about it. It's just taken for granted, yeah, there's a lot of disgusting stuff that's happening uh, in any society. In Singapore, I get the impression, you know, the ways um, so many of these cases get blown up from a little squabble between two people or some stupid act or maybe creative arts act by a US law student, right? And it becomes a national issue. How does it become a national issue so fast? I think that's something we need to think about, right, as a society. Does it suggest that we are also provincial and small-minded? that even basically kampung gossip, you know, this should be relegated to the level of kampung gossip, you know. As in, you know, you hear, hey, interesting thing happened in the US, you know, this guy like that. That's about it. Why does it have to consume the attention of our, our most influential bloggers, our national newspaper, our politicians, and nothing better to worry about. I think the problem is that we haven't uh, woken up to the fact that we are no longer a kampong. You know, we are a city of five million people. It's a diverse, complex city. And of course, in a cosmopolitan city like this, a lot of weird stuff happens. Let's take it for granted. A lot of crazy things are said on the ground. Uh, racist remarks are made. People post, you know, have sex on video, etc. I mean, come on, what do you expect? This is a city of five million people. Of course there must be people having sex on video. And of course some of that is online. It would be weird. The news would be if it doesn't happen. Uh, the question is, uh, has OB markers uh, increased or decreased since the last GE? Yeah? Uh, that was a question from the back earlier. Uh, my, my sense is that um, the OB markers, not as a conscious decision of the government, but simply because of pressure from the ground, uh, have been pulled back quite a bit. Yeah? That things that were considered politically unacceptable to say just two years ago are now quite commonly said, uh, even in public. Yeah? Uh, and of course, this is one of the ways in which OB markers can be pushed back. Yeah? OB markers work when it's only a small number of identifiable individuals who are pushing at the margins, because then they become easy targets. But if everyone is doing it, then that becomes the new political culture. Yeah? And therefore, by definition, the OB marker gets pushed back all. Yeah. My name is Yasmi, and I'm a student reporter from MDIS in the week. And one of my questions will be, do you think that the last 
general election was one of the factors that led to the increasing dairy OB market. Um, last year, there was a spate of racially seditious posts on people's personal profiles on social networking sites. Do you think that these posts are simply reflective of personal opinions or majorly detrimental to society? My name is Sarita, and the last question is um, there are lawyers on this panel today, and what can those without legal knowledge do? to educate their peers on the appearance of the online world. Thank you. <clears throat> um, I think three of the comments, or three of the, the comments or questions that were made were kind of related. One was, of course, the Elden Tan, the Elden Go. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the sex, the anyway, sex blocker. <laughs> oh dear. Um, then the other was about whether more should be done about catching mischievous persons who post on the and the last one was about um, whether racially sensitive remarks on social media is, is, is um, a symptom of like a wider problem. Um, well, I mean, I, I, I can't really tell, what, I'm taking the last question first, I can't really tell whether it is um, a new wider problem. I think it may just be attributable to the fact that it's so easy now to make what would in the past be a private comment that you share with your friends, suddenly viewable by so many people. And sometimes, you know, so it couldn't be that unfortunately this has always been around, that there's been some kind of latent racism or um, prejudice music about people. It's just that you never got to hear about it until social media came about. And then next thing you know, a, a, a brief comment that you write on Facebook, boom, it, you know, 100,000 people can see it. So it could be that just the medium has made it so much easier than it is to inadvertently or otherwise make these points of view known. Um, what should be done about it? Well, you know, as I said just now in my presentation, um, I think that to some extent people should grow thicker skin, and I agree very much with what Sharon has said, but sometimes these things are so minor that when it becomes blown up, it just really it is making a complete mountain out of a molehill sometimes, and that um, then to then say, the law must come down, they must be charged or something, it really, I think, becomes very excessive. And I'd say that this is where, um, why is it some cases become court cases and some don't? It's a matter of um, prosecutorial discretion. Um, sometimes it's seen that this is a statement that we really cannot let people get away with. And so there have been some high profile cases, especially where the person who's making the statement has some degree of prominence, a religious leader or some sort. Uh, or, or the its statement is so inflammatory that they feel something must be done, and then that's when action is taken. Other times it could be that it was, you know, it was a, a, a throwaway remark that the person really didn't realize what effect would have and all that, and then they take the option of instead maybe issuing a warning, or sometimes just a statement saying we disagree with it. You know that that step has been taken in the past before as well. So I think that that we do in a sense have to have um, um, some degree of flexibility here. You cannot expect that the government must make every single case a court case. I think that would be very bad. I mean, technically, a lot of these things, I suppose so, yeah, I suppose they would be offences if you really want to trust the person, right? Putting pornography material online technically is an offence under um, the Films Act, the, the Penal Code. Yeah, but in the end of the day, it is a young chap um, who against other people's better judgment, he went and did this thing. You know, do you really want to, to stick him with a criminal record for the rest of his life? They ate him too. So again, I think some flexibility, some discretion has to be used here. Thank you, speakers. We won't be taking any more questions. Um, but you please do feel free to stay back and engage with the speakers if they have time to engage with you. That is, uh, we have some tokens of appreciation for the speakers and Jeanette will present you to the speakers. Thank you all for coming. Uh, we hope it has been a fruitful afternoon for you. Please do stay back and mingle around and ask some questions.